let's get going with our lesson this morning, which is titled, I follow Paul, and so should you. You say, well, that's really bodacious to say something like that, because we're Christians, and don't we follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Which is uh, what people have been saying for a couple decades, or a few decades now, um, in response to the idea of denominational differences and people caring so much about doctrine. Well, we just are Jesus followers, what people say. And uh, when we talk about Paul, we commonly get a response that, well, you talk too much about him, and you make too much of him. And I want to deal with this issue of why we should follow Paul and why everyone else should too. Okay, and there's a reason for that, and it's a very important one. In Romans 1.16, Paul writes, uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Right, in Romans 1.16. So we all know, and Christians love to talk, use that verse to talk about people being ashamed of preaching uh, and talking about Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. We know that passage. And yet, when we talk about Paul writing that, and you can't find that gospel of Christ anywhere outside of Paul's epistles, uh, well, you're making too much of Paul. You worship Paul. <clears throat> and that accusation, that statement, is very prejudiced, just to point that out. And I know I'm talking to people who understand the teaching of Paul's apostleship, and so that's not an issue necessarily for you, but I want to address today why we shouldn't be timid or ashamed of expressing that to people. And how you can do that without maybe having the offense that maybe you once did by saying that. But we're accused prejudicially that we worship Paul and that we make too much of him. Prejudice means when you answer a matter without hearing it. That's Proverbs 18. Right? That's what that means. And when people say you worship Paul, obviously they don't know what we're doing when we come together. We're not worshiping Paul. Okay, we're not bowing down to him. He's not the mediator between God and man. We don't worship him. Paul himself instructs people not to worship him. All right? And so it's a prejudiced statement. But people say so because they hear us talk so much about him. They hear us talk about the importance of his apostleship. And, and so they have this knee-jerk reaction. Can you make too much of Paul? Is, is when we say we're Pauline, we'll talk more about names and things next week, but to say we're Pauline, is this just causing a confrontation where it doesn't need to be? Or maybe being Pauline isn't that significant. I mean, yes, Paul, everyone takes Paul's epistles. They got a Bible. They're in there, right? So, you know, let's just show them the verses and not mention Paul at all. <clears throat> right? Does it matter at all? Look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. Romans 1, 16 says, Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, in the epistles to Timothy, <clears throat> Timothy is exhorted about a problem he was facing in himself, which I've written about before and called it the number one killer of grace churches. And it's denominations and it's not infighting and things like that. Those These things occur. The number one killer of grace churches, and often it's by abortion before they even get out of the gate, it just kills them, is this idea of being ashamed of being Pauline. Because as soon as they start talking about Paul, they're responsible. We make too much of him. Oh, okay, we'll make less of him then. We won't talk about that as much. And that, that puts you on a different trajectory. Second Timothy 1 verse 8, look what Paul says. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That's Jesus Christ. And everyone goes, amen, don't be ashamed of Jesus. Nor of me, his prisoner. Now, why would Paul say that? I mean, is Paul trying to put himself on the same you know, throne as Jesus? Of course not. But why, why is it important that that Timothy not be ashamed of Paul. And why is it that Timothy is ashamed of Paul? I mean, he's just another minister, right? There's ministers that have problems all the time. I mean, it shouldn't bring shame on someone else necessarily. And the reason why, of course, is Timothy, uh, Paul was Timothy's father in the faith. Timothy was, uh, was, was learning from Paul what God would have him do. And Paul was actually writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy, that epistle there, instructions on how to operate his church based on the doctrine that Christ gave to him. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 verse 3 to teach no other doctrine than that which Paul gave to him, right? Teach no other doctrine. And so Paul emphasizes this thing that, you know, the pattern and what you've learned from me, that's what you're going to set in place. And there are people that would say, well, who's Paul, right? Who's that guy? And look, he's in jail. And he, 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 he persecuted, you know, believers in Jesus before he was saved. You know, so being ashamed of Paul and the message he taught of grace and that we're not under the law, which was an offense to people who think that the only way to be righteous is under the law. We covered that, was it last week, about liberty and lockdowns? The false idea, grace replaces the law. But people think, well, you're teaching a license to sin. That's a shameful thing, and that's not what grace teaches. But 
prejudice, right? But there's a, a, a way where Timothy was being ashamed, being pressured by people in the church, right, or outside of his assembly there, to be ashamed of Paul. And he says, don't be ashamed of the Lord, testimony of the Lord, nor of me as prisoner. By the way, that testimony of the Lord is the testimony that Christ gave to Paul, which he says later in the passage. He says down in verse 11, I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles, appointed by the appearing of Jesus Christ in verse 10. Jesus appeared and gave Paul's information. Look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. And so Paul was in prison, and that was a shameful thing to have the, the dispenser of God's grace locked up in jail. Shouldn't he minister in such a way that he doesn't get thrown in prison? I mean, wouldn't that help him be able to minister to more people? And it's just like God to use someone who was thrown in jail to write half of the epistles for the church today, you know, in, in, from prison. You know, so it's just interesting. Second Timothy two fifteen, of course, we know this passage to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Right? Well, what's it mean not to be ashamed before God in that verse? If you rightly divide the word of truth, right, then you wouldn't be ashamed, showing yourself approved. And of course, that right division conversation always goes into the conversation about the message given to Paul, the message not given. You know, previous dispensations and all that. So I'm pointing this out in that people who are ashamed of being followers of Paul, right, or a question like, well, why should we follow Paul? I follow Jesus. Right? This is, is an attitude or a, a thought process that is contrary to how Christ would intend the church to operate. And again, you say, that's a really bold thing to try to support, Justin. Well, I'm going to support it for you through five reasons of why we should not be ashamed of Paul and that we should follow Paul. And then I'm going to give you 16 reasons or explanations of what it means to follow Paul so that we don't have a misunderstanding. Okay? I follow Paul, and we should not be timid to express that. The word timid means fearful, right? It means like I'm afraid. Being ashamed, the word shame means a painful sensation. Webster's has a great definition for shame. A painful sensation excited by a consciousness of guilt or having done something which injures reputation. Isn't that right? That's what shame is, something that injures reputation. Saying I follow Paul, there's a, isn't there a cringe that you feel like a pain? You're going, don't say that too loud. It's going to hurt our reputation. Right? This is the thought people tend to have. Or by that which nature uh, or modesty prompts us to conceal. We're going to conceal that we follow Paul, even though we do. We're just going to conceal it, because if I reveal it, then, you know, that'll be putting myself out there, naked in front of people. Shame is particularly excited by the disclosure of actions which, in the view of men, are mean and degrading. Like saying, I follow Paul, and everyone else retorts, well, I follow Jesus, waiting for you to apologize that you just confessed to following a man. Right? Uh, Jesus was a man, too, you know. He was also the Son of God. By the way... By saying I follow Paul, I am not in any way diminishing Jesus Christ. And hopefully I'll show you by the end of today's lesson that by following Paul, you are glorifying Christ even more. Okay, and that is why I follow Paul. Right, but we'll get to that a little bit later. But that's what shame is, that, that feeling of shame that if I, I'm going to injure my reputation by doing such a thing. Well, that, that's obviously common for sin, for example, or doing things that are actually wrong. But actually doing things that God commands you to do and feeling shame from that, Paul says you shouldn't be ashamed of doing things that are right. Right? That's why I should follow Paul, you should follow Paul, and everyone in the Christian church should follow Paul. It's a right thing to do, you see. And so I'll give you some reasons here why that should be. Before I get to that, I have to play, give you some pleasure in understanding the etymology of some of these words. Do you see this word timid? This is my, my nerdiness coming out. This means fear, right? Coming from the Latin, timir, which means fear. What does that word look like to you? Do you see Timothy? He was ashamed, right? You know what his word, name means? This comes from the, the Greek and the Latin theos and fear, fear of God. His name means to honor God. You know that word fear in English can have two ways to, to describe it, right? Fear can mean like reverence or it can mean like I'm scared. And it's the same way where these words come from a similar origin. Okay, that, that prefix there, that T-I-M, can mean like I'm scared, like timid. Or it can mean fear like reverence. And his name meant to fear God. And Timothy had a problem with being scared. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Just how that kind of lines up etymologically, the origin of these words. I thought that was interesting. Uh, we shouldn't be timid then, is what I'm saying. We should follow Paul's advice to Timothy and not be timid, but rather uh, fear and honor God in, in light of this. Command from Scripture to follow Paul. 
This is the first reason why we should follow Paul. The Scripture commands it. Look at 1 Corinthians 4. Now, surely you wouldn't want to do something in disobedience to the Scripture. Right. I had one gentleman who, didn't, who couldn't rightly divide. If, if he had a lawnmower and he had a yard a mile long, he couldn't do it. And, and he, in 1 Corinthians 4, it talks about following Paul. He said, I do all the Scripture. So I do everything in the Bible. Right. And I said, you can't do that. Right. There are structures in the Bible that are contradict each other. In one place it says to do this, another place it says to do that, and you just can't do it. Paul, in his epistles, this is New Testament doctrine. I, I don't mean that in the sense of Israel's doctrine. I mean in this part of your Bible, right? There's at least four times that it specifically commands the reader to follow Paul. Now, some of you know those verses are there, but you've only heard them in the past just to justify us saying that. But do you remember that this is inspired scripture? with instructions to the churches. And the fact that churches don't know those verses are there, who've never heard them preached before, is not God's fault. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16, Paul says, in verse 15, Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now remember that passage a little bit later this morning. Paul says he begat them through the gospel. They have many instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. They were saved by the gospel Paul preached to them. This will come up a little bit later. But look at verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. You can ask the question of a Christian who says, I want to do what Christ says, what the Bible says. The Bible says to follow Paul. Well, you might say, well, how does it say that? Well, okay, that's a valid question. We'll get into a little bit. What does it mean? But Paul's saying, follow me. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. We see it again here, very blatantly. And this may help you, by the way, in your, in your th process of thinking, that to say we're, it's, not a, it's not a choice to choose. It's not something where we say, well, there's either Jesus or there's Paul. right? And by saying I follow Paul, we're rejecting Jesus. That's not the option. That's not the choice we're making here. This is how people think that what they think you're doing. That's not what's going on. What's happening, as we'll see, is that it's Jesus Christ who sent the Apostle Paul. Right? He also sent Moses and Peter. Right? There's lots of people God sent to communicate a message. And no one in the past, when they said, well, we follow Moses under Israel's law, would have said, you worship Moses. No, they said Moses went to the mountain and talked to God. God told Moses what to tell us. So that's why we follow Moses. Right? There's a book back on the shelf, a very good book, the Moses and Paul. It talks about that distinction. Right? Just because you're following the messenger of God doesn't mean you're worshiping the messenger of God. Very different. Okay? But Scripture commands, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Ah, that helps a little bit, right? We follow Paul as he followed Christ. Yes, that is biblically true. So you just don't stop and say, I follow Paul, and you say, what about Christ? Well, forget Christ. I follow Paul. I love that guy. No, no. We follow Paul as he follows Christ, as he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. But my first point here, I don't want to get ahead of it, is that the scripture commands this. Paul's instruction, twice in 1 Corinthians, is follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me. Right? As opposed to what? Following someone else as they follow Christ, or following someone else as they follow whomever else. Follow me as I follow Christ. Right? That's the instruction. Look at Philippians 3. You say, well, that was to the Corinthians. The Corinthians are like babies. They needed someone to follow. They needed some help. But, you know, mature Christians, we don't have to follow Paul. We go directly to the Lord. But Paul is not our mediator. Okay? Christ is your head. Paul is not between you and Christ. But look what Paul says. Brethren, be followers together of me. I don't know how you'd be more clear than this. Three times, very clearly, he's saying, follow me. Now, it, obviously, in the scripture you find in Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus said many times to follow him. Remember that? He goes to the fishermen, and he says, drop your nets and follow me, right? Matthew likes to point it out, because he wrote the book, Matthew, and he points out how he met Jesus, and Jesus uh, went to Matthew, and he dropped his, his tax collector books, and Jesus said, follow me. It's those two simple words, and Matthew followed him, right? They literally walked after them. They didn't like his Facebook page or say, yeah, I'm with you, Jesus. i got to go home. You know? No, they actually walked with him. They dropped what they were doing and followed him literally. Right? Today, people talk about following Jesus, who's not on the planet at the moment. And they talk about it more spiritually. Right? 
So it's a little weird the way people talk, use those passages to talk about following him when he meant to those people specifically to follow him. Paul wasn't even in Corinth. He wasn't saying, look, walk the steps that I've actually taken in Corinth. You know, I went to that place and I went to that restaurant. No, he's not saying that. <laughs> he's talking, obviously, about the doctrine and his manner of life and the message and the apostleship, the responsibility he's been given. In Philippians 3, verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and, look what he says, mark them uh, which walk so as you have us for an example. Not only does he say, follow with me together, so it's not just one person. He's saying to the whole group, you all should follow me. But then he says, mark them which also, uh, so as you have an important example. So those people who do follow Paul, you've got to go, okay, since we're supposed to follow Paul and that guy's doing it, I'm just going to follow that guy since he's doing it. Mark them. Right? Which means what? If people aren't following Paul, they are not worthy of marking. Right? And so to have people who are esteemed in Christianity who don't know or spurn the idea of following Paul is really suspect whether they're even qualified to lead anybody in the church. Do you understand? This is serious business, folks. You say, well, this is your hobby horse, Justin. You could say that because you're a Pauline church. We'll cover a little bit later. The, the biggest denomination in America takes its name right, from a man, John the Baptist. Right? And no one has any qualms of saying, I'm Baptist, I'm Baptist, I'm Baptist. You make too much of Paul. Uh, hello, Baptist. You didn't say, I'm the first church of Christ, and there are churches like that, aren't there? That's why they called themselves that, because we're not Baptist, we're the church of Christ. They want to make much of Christ, right? We'll talk about names next week. But Baptist, they took their name from a guy, John the Baptist. You don't find the word Baptist in the Bible anywhere uh, separate from the name John, Right? It doesn't say Jesus the Baptist, or Paul the Baptist, or Peter the Baptist, it's John the Baptist. Right. It's interesting. Anyway, we'll do more of that next week. In Philippians 3, verse 17, Mark them which do so, which walk so, so you have them for an end sample. Apparently, those who Paul says can be your pattern, right, your instruction, you know, your, your leader, are, are those that are following me as I follow Christ. So, we should say proudly, not timidly, I follow Paul, because that's showing a spiritual understanding that is more mature than saying not so, than being timid about it. It's like, ah, you know, Paul's just a guy and not important. He's just a great missionary. No, he's much more than that, folks. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 7, verse, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 7 through 9. For yourselves know, now we just read three passages to you in the Bible where Scripture commands the readers to follow Paul as he follows Christ. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 7, Yourselves know how you ought to follow us. Now that's not a command for you to follow him, but he's kindly assuming the fact. You guys already know you should follow us. Right? But I fear, since people don't even proclaim that they follow Paul, that people don't know that they ought to be. So they read right past that. Paul says, you, ought, you know you ought to follow us. You already, I already told you that. You already know that. But how do people actually make that conscious determination? That doctrinal decision. That belief that what Christ told Paul is what Christ tells me. Right? That's what that means. Look at verse 7. You know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, neither do we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Following Paul's pattern there would really help the bad reputation the church has regarding money. They followed Paul. But in verse 9, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. You see? Paul seems to be obsessed with gaining a following. And isn't that kind of the instruction or the warning that people give young pastors today. Don't just go out there and try to get a following, you know. I think everywhere Paul's saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. I mean, so it's like, it's a biblical pattern, right? No, I'm saying that facetiously. It is bad advice to try to just go seek a following. What I'm pointing out is that Paul was doing that specifically because he was given an apostleship to follow by Jesus Christ. You're not Paul, I'm not Paul. Okay. Christ chose Paul as a chosen vessel to be his minister. Okay? Therefore, when the scripture says to follow him, that's God-inspired scripture, you've got to say, I guess we're supposed to follow Paul. Right? And maybe you get to the point where you don't say it too timidly. You say, I follow Paul. We follow Paul. You should follow Paul. We should all follow Paul as he followed Jesus Christ. Right? 
Number one, the scripture commands it. You make too much of Paul. Well, I don't make too much of scripture. That's for sure. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? They say, well, I follow Jesus, not Paul. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I've advised you before when people respond to you, well, I follow Jesus, not Paul. Your answer should be very simple, three words. Jesus sent Paul. If you follow Jesus, he sent Paul, which means you follow him, you're going to follow Paul. You see? Christ sent him. Look at John 13, verse 20. Jesus' words before he revealed the mystery to Paul, before Paul was saved. John 13, verse 20. And I'm reading this to you because there's a teaching that thinks, well, I'm going to follow Jesus, and Jesus is all that matters, which is really, it's naive. Jesus, think about this for a moment. I, I'm saying this very specifically in my words. Jesus did not pen Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He didn't. Now, him being God inspired all Scripture. That's true, obviously. But Jesus did not write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote those books. And who are those guys? Apostles. Matthew, John, Mark. These are guys that, Jesus, that walked with Jesus, right? Talked with Jesus. They learned of Jesus. Had authority given to them by Jesus. And they wrote books about Jesus. And everyone has no problem, no qualms with following the writings of John and Matthew and Mark as they wrote about Jesus. Right? Why is it that when we say we follow Paul, oh, you're worshiping a man. So, so who do you worship? Matthew or Mark or Luke or John? No, no, it's Jesus. Well, which letter did he write in the Bible? He didn't write any of them. God inspired all of them through men. Right? I'm just pointing that out. People forget that. But John 13, verse 20, look what Jesus said. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receives whomsoever I send receives me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. What's the corollary to that? If you don't receive who Jesus sends, you don't receive Jesus. Right? If Jesus sent Paul and you neglect the sending that Jesus gave to Paul, you're neglecting Jesus. Paul says so much in other passages of Scripture. Where he says in 1 Corinthians 14, the words that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord Jesus. How dare he? But he did because Christ told him to. I could never say that, right? Because I, I'm not an apostle sent from Jesus Christ. You know, I, I haven't been given the words of Jesus Christ up through this book. But Paul says the commandments I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acknowledge that. He says acknowledge those things. Look at Acts 9 verse 15. These passages aren't new to most of you, but I'm just trying to emphasize here why saying I follow Paul should not be something we feel guilty about as if we've done something wrong. You could say I follow Paul and be quoting scripture. Follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Acts 9. The sad state of affairs is that people are so doctrinally watered down in their understanding or ignorant of the Bible entirely that they don't understand the importance of the apostleship and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And some of that's been lost over the years. And so you're doing a service to the church to communicate to them where they find their instructions in the Bible, where they find the Lord Jesus Christ's will for them. Acts 9 verse 15, the Lord said unto him, this is Jesus Christ, okay, saying about the Apostle Paul, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. He's talking to Ananias. He's talking about Paul. For he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings, the children of Israel. Now, i got to point out here that when was Jesus talking about this? You have the cross. This is the historical timeline. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before the cross talking about that, that period there in Jesus' life and then his death and resurrection. And then you have Acts 9. Isn't that over here? This is after the Holy Spirit was given, after Jesus rose from the dead. Acts 9 is over here, right? And Jesus is talking. To think that I follow Jesus and limit yourself to these books or Acts 2 is to miss the Bible. Jesus is talking in Acts 9. And what did Jesus say in Acts 9? Right? I chose this guy to communicate my message. Right? Acts 9, verse 15, He's chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Right? In a very real sense there, Paul was the first Christian in the body of Christ. Christ sent him. Look at Acts 26, verse 15. Acts 26, verse 15. You know, Peter and those guys followed Jesus before he died. Paul the lone apostle, chosen of Jesus after his resurrection. 
Acts 26, verse 15 through 18. This is a testimony of conversion, where Jesus, after Paul asks, Who are you, Lord? Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, who have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, and whom, uh, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them uh, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's a big commission. But that's after Matthew 28, the so-called Great Commission. Well, what's greater than the Great Commission is this more excellent commission given to Paul. Okay? And it, that's not explained to people. In Galatians 1, verse 1, Paul says about his own ministry that it's not of man. He says, I'm an apostle, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, but it's not of man that he was made such. Missionaries are typically sent from a home church. And so the reason why people call Paul a great missionary is because they think the church began at Pentecost in Jerusalem. And so he was just a branch off of that. But Galatians 1 verse 1, Paul writes, Paul an apostle. And he clarifies what he means by an apostle. I'm not an apostle of men. There were apostles that men sent. And thus they were, that's what apostle means, a sent one, right? That were sent from these other men, Right? But Paul was an apostle not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Galatians 1 is his justification and defense that his apostles of the ministry and gospel were given and revealed to him by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Right? The point here, Jesus Christ sent Paul. That's why you should follow Paul. He sent Paul after he sent Peter. He sent Paul with something greater than what he sent Peter to do. And so all these reasons, I think, are justified. Just historically, folks, if you're looking at the timeline historically, and if you're saying that, well, when Jesus came, the apostles of Pentecost are just following Jesus, and if you were to think that Paul, he's just following these guys, then if you're next in line, who are you following? Paul. Just historically. This is the last time Jesus spoke to people is through the apostle Paul. Right? So just historically. But there's more than that, folks. There's authority Christ gave to him. Right? There's a message. In Romans 11, 13, Jesus Christ, again, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom people say, I follow, I follow, I follow. Well, he made Paul your apostle. An apostle is one who's sent to establish and, and propagate a message given by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 11, verse 13, it's very clear. Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle. Now, who made him an apostle? Jesus made him an apostle, directly. I'm an apostle of the Gentiles he says, I magnify mine office. Paul nowhere magnifies himself, and neither are we when we say we follow Paul. It's his office. Okay, in fact, if you want to say his apostle, I'm right there with you. The man himself was a sinner like the rest of us, right? No worth of glory or honor. And yet, these epistles are inspired by God. It's in those epistles, in his ministry and apostleship that Christ gave to him. His office that we magnify. Because people don't even know he had one. They think he just got up one day and said, I'm going to be a missionary. He didn't. Christ appeared to him and said, I've given you a special authority, a special apostleship, and that special apostleship was not to Israel. It was to Gentiles, of which all of us are. And if you're not, then you know, you're a rare exception in this dispensation. And praise God for it. Jew there's no Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ. And by the way, to Acts 9.15, Christ did send Paul also to the children of Israel. Right as he went among Gentile territories and all that. And so, he was an apostle of the Gentiles. In Romans 15, 16, even though Paul says about Jesus that he was a minister of the circumcision, talking about his ministry to the circumcision in the red letters, right? Romans 15, 16, Paul says, I'm the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Do you see what he said there? I'm a minister of Jesus Christ. So, hearing Paul and his message is hearing Jesus Christ and what he wants the Gentiles to know. That's us, folks, in America in 2020. In Ephesians 3, verse 1, Paul says clearly, this is not just like a, a trivial verse or where you find just a, a weird verse every, here and there. It's like over and over again, these passages come up. It's the fact that people don't really spend a lot of time in Paul's epistles, the reason why they don't know them, I think. Because those who do know that they're there. It's not that everyone doesn't, but it's easier to preach from stories. It's easier to preach from stories. And there are no stories in Paul's epistles. Acts has some good stories. Matthew, Luke, and John has some great stories. But 
Paul's epistles are doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. It's heavy, heavy, heavy. In Ephesians 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. See that? Christ sent him to Gentiles. He didn't just pick on a map where he wanted to be a missionary. You know, I'm tired of Jerusalem. I'm going to the Gentiles. That's like the whole world, you know. He was given that commission by Jesus Christ specifically because of this dispensation of grace. Galatians 2, verse 9, Paul writes in Galatians 2, that the authority that was, the, a similar authority that was given to Peter to the circumcision was given to him to the uncircumcision. Galatians 2, down in verse 7. When they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me. Do you see that? The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me. Who committed the gospel of the uncircumcision to Paul? Christ. He says the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter. So see, Christ did give Peter something, an authority, an apostleship. And he gave Paul something that was different. So the question is, who are you following? Who's your apostle? And don't think that's not an issue, folks. A majority of worldwide Christianity in name follows this guy right here as the first pope, they think. Right? So yes, people make a choice to follow someone else other than Jesus. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church would not say we don't follow Jesus. Of course they do. They follow Jesus as he instructed the first pope. That's their teaching. <laughs> right? What are we saying? You say, well, we're not starting a Catholic Church. That's for certain. Paul's doctrine pro prohibits that sort of thing. But the reason why we have a Catholic Church, folks, is because they've got their apostle wrong. If the Roman Catholic Church, instead of Peter, chose Paul as their pope, there wouldn't be a Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church. Right? Because there wouldn't be the religion. There wouldn't be the special days. There wouldn't be the laws. There wouldn't be the legalism. There'd be grace, 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 grace. And that's not what you find in the Roman Catholic Church. You see? There's a reason why Jesus Christ set up Paul as an apostle and gave him the message that he did. So Scripture commands us to follow Paul. The Lord Jesus Christ sent Paul. The Lord made him your apostle, specifically to you. Like, we don't have to guess. It's like, well, you know, Christ sent Paul, but what's that to do with me? Well, he sent Paul to you. That's what it has to do with you. Right? I mean, it's very specifically laid out there. And God commanded that he be a pattern. So it's not like I sent an apostle to you and he did his work 2,000 years ago, but now forget Paul. You know, well, look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the, what's that big long word there? Commandment. commandment of God our Savior. He was an apostle by the commandment. And down to verse 16, it's for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ, remember to see Jesus Christ working through him? Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a, what's that word? Pattern? To them, who? Pattern to who? I mean, surely it's just a Timothy, right? To them which should hereafter believe unto life everlasting. Now that includes you, right? Have you believed to life everlasting in Jesus Christ since Paul? If the answer is yes, then that's because of Paul's pattern. This verse is extremely significant that it's saying that Paul was the pattern of salvation to everyone that believes after. Well, Christ is my Savior. Yes, Christ is your Savior, but Christ didn't need saved. Think about that. Christ is your Savior, and He's my Savior, but He didn't need saved. He did the saving. Paul needed saved, so only Paul could be a pattern. Jesus couldn't be a pattern of salvation to you. He could only provide salvation to you. And so he chose this worst sinner here, this chief of sinners, and said, I'm going to save that guy who's persecuting me and make him a pattern to everyone else. So whenever someone who gets the gospel says, well, I'm too bad to be saved, well, that guy was killing people in the name of Christ. Right? That's a pattern of long-suffering to those that should have to believe. So if you want to say in that regard, which is our next point, that the gospel is committed to him, I follow Paul in that. The way he was saved is the way I'm saved. Then yes, that's what we mean. Okay? God commanded that Paul be a pattern. By the way, see what happens in the next verse in verse 17? After he says, I'm a pattern to them which should hereafter believe, what's he say? Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Because as he says, he made me a pattern, he doesn't want to think that that's where it stops. Right? He may be a pattern of salvation, and who saved me? Jesus Christ. Right? God saved me by his grace. Right? Paul didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. That's what grace means. But God commanded him to be a pattern nonetheless. And he put it in the scripture, folks. This isn't a story you hear from a missionary in a distant land that writes a biography about their tales and 
and experiences. This is something inspired by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. He chose Paul. He sent him as an apostle to you, wrote his conversion and his life and ministry in a book, said this is inspired and this is your pattern. It can't be more clear than that. And people go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John digging for the things that Paul says so clearly. Where is the will of God? Reading about Jesus' earthly life as he walked around doing the fishing and, and you know, breaking the bread and healing and walking on the water. And in Paul's epistles very clearly, this is the will of God. Things that you need are found in what Christ sent Paul. Right? If the church doesn't follow Paul, folks, that may be an explanation for why the church is in the state that it's in. Right? Amen. It's an ignorance. <laughs> Lastly, and most important of these five reasons of why following Paul should not be so shameful of an idea. The scripture commands it. Lord Christ sent Paul. The Lord made him your apostle. He was sent to you. He commanded him to be a pattern. And lastly, and most importantly, perhaps, is that the gospel that saved you was committed to him. Said another way, you cannot find the gospel that saves outside of the life and ministry inspired in the scripture of Apostle Paul. Right? You can't. If you rip Paul's epistles and ministry out of the scriptures so that you have no semblance of Paul in the Bible, you would not know what the gospel, the grace of God is. Okay? That's how important that is, part of the Bible, to what we do today as the church for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Christ is glorified and magnified by people being saved by his grace, taking his gospel of grace out of the scripture is doing the worst to not glorify God that you ever could. Right? Let's look at a few passages. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, verse 17. See how many verses are on this outline here? There is not a dearth of evidence to show that we need to follow Paul. It's not like, well, you found some obscure verse somewhere. It's everywhere. You see? In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 17, I've had people tell me, maybe you had the same experience, that I can't believe I've never seen that before. You ever had that experience? You're reading, oh, I can't believe I've never seen that before. It's so clear on the page. I had that experience too. It's like, uh, I just wasn't reading there. I, don't, I didn't know that was there. I thought dispensationalism was a, a man-made, invented teaching. Well, the word's in the Bible. Oh, I didn't even know that was there. Mystery. You talk about mystery all the time. Well, it's in the Bible, like many times. You follow Paul, it's not like you worship the guy. No, the Bible says follow Paul as he followed Jesus Christ. So, i got to say it. Maybe I need to figure out what that means, but the Bible says to do it. Right? In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 17. If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. You see that? A dispensation, that's something God hands out. A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto Paul. And what commentators do with that verse right there is say, in the same way it was given to Paul, is the same way it's given to you. So he's just talking about everyone who's saved has an obligation uh, to hold the gospel. That's what they explain that with. A dispensation committed unto him. That's the only thing that we say. We need to be careful not saying too much, you know, that the Bible doesn't say, but what we do say is the dispensation was given to Paul, and that's what the verse says. Very clearly. Look at, Galatia, or look at 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. We already saw in Galatians 2, 7 that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. And it wasn't committed unto Peter, by the way. That verse says it was committed unto Paul as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So There's a different thing there. But 2 Corinthians 4, look at verse 3. This verse is significant regarding a gospel committed to Paul. Because if Paul had written some of these words a little differently, it would mean something entirely different. But he says instead, if our gospel, our gospel? Like, what's that mean? If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Apparently, if the gospel that Paul preached was hidden and is hidden from anyone, then they're lost. That's why I said before, I said, you take Paul's epistles out of the Bible, his ministry out of the Bible, and you don't have the gospel, people don't, don't get saved, right? That's the verse right there. Well, you say, well, Peter taught the same gospel, right? Well, that's why we have to do the comparison of the verses, right? The gospel he's talking about, look at verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. See that phrase, gospel of Christ? You want to guess in the Bible the only place that shows up? Paul's epistles. You don't find the phrase gospel of Christ anywhere outside of Paul's epistles. 
Now, that's just the phrase, but there's also a meaning behind it. The, he says the glorious gospel of Christ. Prophecy, as we're learning through Isaiah, prophecy about Christ sounded like this. There will be a Savior that comes, and he will be a lamb, and he will give his life, will bleed and die and suffer for your sins. What a shame. That, that has to happen for you. Right? The glorious gospel of Christ is... God committed his love toward you and that while you were a sinner, he died for you and resurrected in glory to give you the power of everlasting life because he died for you. That's the glorious gospel of Christ. That's why Paul says, God forbid that I glory save in the, in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The preaching of the cross is a glory is what 2 Corinthians 4 is talking about. And if that be hid for people and all they know about the cross is the same, you got to wonder whether or not they know what saves them or not. What is the glory of your salvation? I mean, how do you know you're saved? Where do you, how, when do you rejoice in them being saved? Typically, the people who think the cross was a shame are still waiting to be saved. They're waiting, and, you know, that when they die and go to heaven, that Christ will accept them. The glorious gospel is that because of his death, you are accepted in the beloved. Amen. Glory to God. Rejoice, right? It's a different attitude about it. So what Paul says is true. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. We'll go through the second half a little faster, but I've got to go through these a little slower just to show you the importance of and the, and the abundance of passages that deal with following Paul and his, his gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile. Paul was exhorting the Thessalonians to follow them. Okay, in fact, he says in chapter 1, let's see if I can find the passage here, in verse 6, ye became followers of us and of the Lord. As if the Lord second to Paul, he's not. Follow me as I follow Christ, right? Ye became followers of us and of the Lord. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says, we were allowed of God. We were not lying here. We weren't doing it out of selfish reasons. We were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing man, but God which tries the hearts. Who was put in trust with the gospel? Paul. Right? Verse chapter 1, he says, you're followers of us. Because the gospel they received was from him. First Corinthians 15, the gospel that saves that Christ died for your sins was delivered unto Paul, first of all, and delivered unto them. First of all, by Paul. Okay. Romans 16, 25, Paul talks about the establishment of you by God according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the Revelation of the Mystery. If you take that word grace, for example, in the Bible, Paul uses the word a hundred times. The gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. He uses the word grace a hundred times. And in the New Testament portion of the scripture, 80% of the times the word grace is used is in Paul. You take him out, you're missing 80% of the times God dispenses his grace. And the other times, by the way, you want to do a deeper study on that, the times where grace is used outside of Paul's epistle in the New Testament is not the same way Paul uses it. It's different. Okay, we'll see that come up again a little bit later about the Spirit. It'll shock you maybe about the walking after the Spirit. We'll deal with that a little bit later. Without Paul, there's no gospel of grace. There's no gospel of Christ. The book of Romans is gone. You say, well, who cares about Romans? Martin Luther did. Romans sparked the Protestant Reformation. You know, Martin Luther, he wasn't given an apostleship of Christ. Paul was, right? Martin Luther said about Romans, we did the, we, I, I mentioned this quote to you back when we studied it verse by verse. Martin Luther says, Romans is the true masterpiece of the New Testament, the very purest gospel, which is well worth and deserving that a Christian man should not only learn it by heart, word for word, but also that he should daily deal with it as the daily bread of men's souls. It can never be too much or too well read or studied, and the more it is handled, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. That was Romans. And the book of Romans has saved more people than any other book of the Bible. Not because of Paul. Because of Christ. But Paul wrote it, sent from Christ, right? If you're saved, you're saved by Paul's gospel, whether you know it or not. Someone may not have said that Paul wrote this, but if they told you the gospel, it's because Paul wrote it down in the scripture first, as he was given it by revelation and inspiration of Jesus Christ, right? Do you see the importance of that in the scripture? So, as a church, as the body of Christ, we have to recognize the pattern for which we evangelize. Many churches don't even say what I just said. Well, you could take Paul out and be based on their teaching. They say that you can teach the gospel without Paul. He's just a missionary. Because what's the gospel in their mind? John 3.16? Right? 1 John 4? Acts 2.38? You don't need Paul for those. The question is, will those save you? 
That's, the, that's a serious question, right? But if it's, if it's true that they will not, and that's not complete in the information, the knowledge of understanding of what the gospel is, then you need these writings. As a church, and we minister and evangelize to people, we need to follow Paul and his evangelism pattern, his gospel presentation. The purest gospel is what he calls it. We call it that, I thought daily bread was appropriate, Martin Luther said, is your daily bread, because people often turn to Matthew 6 for their daily bread, right? If you turn to Romans for your daily bread, it'll change your life. It really will. Okay? But there was something else committed to him, and I haven't even got to that yet. You know, normally talk about Paul and the mystery, Paul and the mystery, Paul and the mystery. I'm talking about following Paul, I haven't even mentioned the mystery yet. Scripture commands it, Lord Jesus Christ sent him, he's your apostle, he's commanded to be a pattern of salvation, he was committed to the gospel for which we preach and that we understand. Right? It's the cross, not the cradle. It's the cross, not a covenant. It's the cross. It's his grace that saves. But something else is committed to him, and it's that something else that makes all the difference for your life, walk, destiny, purpose in the church. You can be saved and not understand at all how to live as a Christian. Right? Right. All that that comes after your salvation you find in Paul's epistles. So this mystery of Christ, this fellowship of Christ, this instruction on how to be the church and how to build it up and how to operate, Christ gave to the Apostle Paul. Okay? For example, now Colossians 1, 25 and 26 is the passage I, I mentioned there where Paul says a dispensation was given to me, even the mystery, which was kept secret, was hidden from ages and generations. But what does it mean to follow Paul? I'm not going to expound the mystery this morning. That's, we've had lessons on that. But what does it mean to follow him? We shouldn't be ashamed. The scripture says that Christ told us to do it. God commanded him to be a pattern. What does it mean? Well, what about this? You receive the will of God through Paul. How about that? What you do when you ask yourself the question of what would God have me do? What is his will? You find in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, people might say, well, I find it in the whole Bible. But you can't do that. Because the Bible has different instructions, doing different things. And at one point, God's building a kingdom. At one point, he's destroying a kingdom. At one point, he's not building a kingdom at all. So you're confused, you see. You've got to know which part that God has revealed is actually his instructions to you. And so to say that I receive the will of God as it's revealed in the epistles to the apostles of the Gentiles, right? That's what it means to follow Paul in one way. Ephesians 3, 2, where we saw before that a dispensation was given unto him. In Ephesians 3, verse 2, is the dispensation of the grace of God. So specifically details what he's doing. He gave it to me, to you word, is what he said. So that whole idea of he's given it to me to pass on to you and you pass on to others, to faithful. This is something Paul laid out that Christ told him to do. What about in, first, in, uh, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9? Look at Philippians 4, verse 9. Paul says to the Philippians, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, what's he say? Do. do. What does God want me to do, Christians asked. Well, over and over again, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, this is the will of God that all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Or uh, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. Or to avoid fornication, this is the will of God concerning you. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. He says it clearly in other, other passages, but here in Philippians 4, 9, look what he says. You have learned it, you've received it, you've heard it, you've seen it in me, do it. That is Paul uh, actually performing the pattern work. In 1 Timothy 1, he says, I'm a pattern. Well, here, he's like, what's that mean? It means what you've learned from me, what you've received from me, what you've heard from me, what you've seen in me, do. That's what it means to say, Paul's the pattern, I follow him. And folks, you, you can't do worse than that because we're not talking, again, we're not talking about like, Paul alone. It's Paul as he was sent from Jesus, you see. It's follow Paul as they follow Jesus. It's in these epistles that we find the instructions. It's amazing in history, like I said, the Protestant Reformation, the whole Reformed denomination, the covenant denominations, get their seed doctrines from the Apostle Paul. So even though they're not dispensational, they're following Paul to the degree that they're right. right? You get rid of Paul, they can't be Reformed anymore. They go to Romans 9, Ephesians 1, that's Paul. Right? There's something to this. Philippians 4 verse 9. What you've seen, heard, received in, in Paul do. What about your foundation on the, on, uh, is the one that Paul laid? What does it mean to follow Paul if your foundation is the one that Paul laid? Now in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, a common objection to this idea when you follow Paul is 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. 
where Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye perfectly, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Right? There's unity. There needs to be unity in the church. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Right? Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. People go, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say I follow Paul, but Paul says, don't say I'm of Paul, I'm of Christ. No, he doesn't say don't say that. He says there's contentions. Some say I'm of Paul, I'm of Christ, I'm of Peter, I'm of Apollos. Why are they saying that? Why aren't they all like on the same page in what God is doing? Don't forget, when someone says, well, right there, Paul says, don't say I'm of Paul. Then why did Paul write three chapters later, follow me? And why did he write ten chapters later, follow me? You see, when he says that you should be of the same mind and the same judgment, the question naturally follows, whose mind and judgment should you be of? Right? The mind of Christ, but where do you find that? In the apostleship of Paul. And Paul knew that. He says, what I write to you are the commandments of Jesus Christ. Which means what? About that group in Corinth that was saying, well, I'm not of Paul, I'm of Christ. What were they saying? Everyone wants to say, I'm of the Christ group here. Right? If it's wrong to say I'm of Paul, it's just as wrong to say I'm of Christ, right? Oh, no, no, not of Christ. Well, so you're picking them. Is that what you're doing? We well, say Christ is the Savior. I get that. And Christ is God. Yes, I understand that. But why are they against Paul? Why are they against Paul? In your Schofield Bible, if you have a Schofield Bible, in the introduction to 2 Corinthians, uh, C.I. Schofield says this about this verse. It is evident that the really dangerous sect in Corinth was that which said, and I of Christ. Why? They rejected the new revelation through Paul of the doctrines of grace, grounding themselves probably on the kingdom teachings of our Lord as a minister of the circumcision. Seemingly oblivious that a new dispensation had been introduced by Christ's death, this made necessary a defense of the origin and extent of Paul's apostolic authority as he does through 1 and 2 Corinthians. Schofield made his Bible over 100 years ago, folks. This is not new information today in 2020. This is something that has been known. Okay? And he talks about that. The dangerous sect was those who said him of Christ. And it's the same today. The dangerous sect. Some say, I follow Peter. Pope, right? Some say, I follow Paul. Some say, I follow Christ. But Jesus followed. The dangerous sect of those who say, I follow Paul. Or follow, <laughs> follow Jesus. Follow Christ. Right? Because those who say, I follow Jesus, what they're doing is neglecting that Christ himself returned and gave an apostle to you. They're rejecting the entire new revelation about the church and the dispensation of grace. What they're doing is going back to the teachings of Jesus under the earthly ministry, and that's why it's dangerous. They're going back before the gospel was given, before the church was formed, you see. But it's not about worshiping men. It's about knowing what God said, and when he sends a messenger, when Christ sends someone in his name, you receive that person he's received in his name, and you receive Christ, right? And so if your foundation, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10. If your foundation is the one Paul laid, then you're following Paul. What foundation did Paul lay? In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, which we've already covered before, there's another passage to add to that list, as a wise master builder, he's not just another builder, but a master builder, I have laid the foundation. Now how many times when you're building a house do you lay a foundation? Hopefully, yeah. Once. Right? Paul said, who, who laid the foundation? Was it Peter at Pentecost? Today is Pentecost Sunday. Did you know that? 49, it's, it's, it's 49 days after Easter. Pentecost Sunday. Welcome to Pentecost Sunday, everybody. And I looked this up. What is Pentecost Sunday? You know, and it says, the birthday of the church. Happy birthday. That's when it began, 49 days after Easter, on the Jewish holiday of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given from heaven from Jesus Christ. When was Paul saved? Here began here. What has Paul just got done saying in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10? Who laid the foundation? Paul did. Not if the birthday of the church was in Acts 2. Then Peter laid the foundation and Paul was just adding on to it. Right? Doesn't everybody explain Paul as if, well, you know, Peter started it and then Paul just added things onto it. Not so, folks. He laid the foundation. In fact, he says elsewhere, I'm not going to build on any other man's foundation talking about Peter. Peter and Paul both built a foundation of what? Look at verse 11. 
Other foundation can no man lay than that is lay, which is Jesus Christ. The Pauline foundation is Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. The Petrine foundation is Jesus Christ, according to prophecy. You see, there's a big difference. That's why Paul says in verse 10, let every man take heed how he builds upon. You all are building. Paul laid the foundation because Christ gave him a mystery and said, you lay that down as a pattern for the church and everyone else builds on it. And if you're building on another man's foundation or building on no foundation or making your own thing up, you're doing it wrong. You're doing Christianity wrong. You're doing the church wrong. You see? That's why it's important. But if your foundation is the one Paul laid, Jesus Christ, according to the mystery, then yeah, of course you're following Paul's building pattern. That's just obvious. If your church receives his identity and doctrine from Paul, then that's what it means to follow Paul. Ephesians 3, verse 3. I'm just walking down through Ephesians 3 this morning. Ephesians 3, verse 3. He says, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. I've been given a dispensation to give to you in verse 2, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Right? And this mystery in Ephesians 1 is described as the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, it's the members of one body. By one spirit, you're baptized into one body. This new creature, this mystery entity, this new man. That's what Paul says was given to him, a mystery of Christ and his body. And if, so if your church receives its identity as this new creature of the body of Christ, then you're following Paul. Because you only find the language of the new creature and the body of Christ in Paul's epistles. You don't find it anywhere else. That's why Schofield wrote in Ephesians 3, 6, uh, 100 years ago, that in Paul's writings alone, we find the doctrine, position, walk, and destiny of the church. Without Paul's epistles, you wouldn't find the definition of what the church is today. You'd find a Pentecostal group trying to seek the kingdom and Holy Ghost powers, waiting for the end times, looking for signs. Oh, that is what's happening today. <laughs> That's not what God's doing. Okay? But if your church receives identity and doctrine from him, then you follow Paul. The doctrine like 2 Timothy 3.16 where Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is sufficient, right? He says it's, it's able to make the man of God perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. That's Paul's doctrine, the all scripture. I love it when they quote, you back, we'll quote that back to you. You say you need to rightly divide and they say, well, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I say, yep, that's Pauline. I'm, I'm, I follow Paul. <laughs> you don't find that verse anywhere else in the Bible, which is to say God wasn't done with it yet, Right? So if you're not following Paul in that teaching, then what are you looking for? New prophets, new revelations, new information. But if all scriptures give by inspiration of God and it's profitable, to make man of God perfect, it's complete. If in Colossians 1.25, Paul says, I fulfill the word of God, then if you're Pauline, if you follow Paul, then the scripture is all you need. Right? You've heard other people teach that, right? And they're not mid-ex, they don't call themselves mid-ex, but they teach that doctrine. That's a Pauline doctrine, folks. You follow Paul in that or else you face problems. You see? So all these things is what it means to follow Paul. What about your traditions and church order? People say, well, yeah, I understand Paul was given a mystery and he was a special apostle, but their church traditions and the way they do church is entirely different from what Paul would establish as a tradition. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, there are good traditions that Paul lays down. He says, the traditions you've received of us. If you haven't received a tradition from Paul, then you are really seriously questioning the tradition in the church that you're performing. Okay. Paul's scared of the Galatians that they're keeping special days. In 1 Corinthians eleven thirty four, 34, Paul says, Do all things decently and in order. The things that, I'll set things in order when I come. Well, who's Paul to set things in order? Oh, I forgot. He's a special chosen vessel by the Lord Jesus Christ to give a pattern to the church today who's saved by the gospel of the grace of God. And that's, what he, that's who he is. And so he lays down the order in his epistles. That's why a lot of his epistles don't only deal with his conversion in the gospel and grace, but also how the church should operate and function. That's the order that Paul's setting up. Christians like to say that Christ delivered two ordinances to us, to the church, two sacraments. We dealt with one of them earlier this morning in our, our Q&A. But inevitably, one is water baptism. And that is not something you read about anywhere in Paul's epistles. Whether you, whether you answer the question about how Paul did it or why he did it to some, you don't find any instruction in his epistles to water baptize. Not a single one. You do find instructions to water baptize all over Jesus' earthly ministry in Acts 2, supposedly the birthday of the church. So you can tell if someone names their church after John, over here, and water baptism, even though it's not for salvation. I, I love that response. We don't do it for salvation. Then why do you do it? 
is an ordinance, a command, obedience, an instruction, a tradition. Whatever the answer is, it's not Pauline. Because if Paul is your pattern, it's a tradition that fall, fell to the wayside of history. Right? But how many disputes and contentions have surrounded the issue of water baptism? It's because people do not follow Paul. Right? If people followed Paul, the church would be unity, folks. It really would. You wouldn't have some of the contentions between law and grace if you followed Paul, because Paul settles that one. Right? But they don't recognize the dispensational difference. I put 1 Timothy, and it's not an error that I did not put a verse reference, because the entire book of 1 Timothy lists the traditions and orders for a church in Ephesus that Timothy was leading. Right? But that's also contention. People want to use Matthew 18 instead of 1 Timothy as their instruction on how to discipline people or how to respond to different needs of the church. In Acts chapter 2 and 3, everyone in the church sold all that they had. They put it all together in a pool and distributed by the apostles to those that had need. In 1 Timothy 5, Paul says, the church isn't chargeable for that. And you better take care of your own house, buddy. Wait, Paul, aren't you following Peter? Nope. Didn't you follow Jesus who said, sell everything you had and give it to the poor? Nope. What's he following then? Jesus Christ, as he appeared unto him. You see, a different pattern, different instruction. So if your traditions and church order comes from Paul, that's what it means. What about if you're faithful to understand the and minister the mystery of Christ? In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says, count of us as stewards of the mysteries. Right? And it's required of a steward to be faithful. If you can understand and minister the mystery of Christ, then you follow Paul, folks, because you can't understand that without Paul. A lot of people don't even know what the mystery is in the Bible. And thus, they can't steward it if they don't know what it is. But this is what the church has been instructed to do. If you speak abundantly about the grace and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you follow Paul. Galatians 6.14 says, God forbid that I glory, saving the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts 13.43, <clears throat> this is an interesting passage. Look here at Acts 13. Acts 13.43. <clears throat> Paul speaks more about God's grace and God's glory through Jesus Christ than any other writer of the Bible. And I'm not talking about prophecies that speak of Jesus. Okay, because those are abundant. Isaiah included has some amazing prophecies about that. But just directly, plain and clear, talking about the glory of God and His grace through Jesus Christ, Paul speaks more than any other in the Scripture. Okay, in Acts 13.43, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Everywhere, it seems, that's what Paul's speaking about. If all that comes out of your mouth is grace, 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 grace. That's what Paul did. That's what Christ told him to do. Right? Nowhere do you find Paul tempering grace. Well, it's grace, but there's too much grace, you know. He never said something like that. He said grace is abundant, his unspeakable gift. Wonderful grace of Jesus. The song is Pauline, folks. We did hardly change it for our hymnal. If you're speaking grace, if you're a grace ambassador, you're Pauline. That's what that is. You're not Baptist, you're not Methodist, you're Pauline. Right? That's what that looks like. People have this question. We'll deal with this next week a little bit, too. They say, well... You know, I understand the mystery and dispensational charts, and Paul was an apostle of the Gentiles. Uh, I'm still a Baptist. You've got to drop that thing quick, because you're not following Paul at all in that. You're double-minded. Okay? If you want to elevate Christ above yourself to the extent that you diminish yourself to be the least and the chief of sinners, then you follow Paul. That's what Paul did. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, he says, I am the chief of sinners. It's because of Christ's long suffering and grace that I can even be said to be saved. That's what Paul talked like. That's not how Peter talked like, and that's not how John talked like. And that's, they're under covenants. That's how Paul talked like. Because under grace, it makes sin abundant so that grace abounds over it. You're not saved by anything else but by His grace. So if you want to elevate Christ above you, in fact, if you want to elevate Christ above all things, then you better follow Paul in the way he talked about Christ. The prophecy elevates Christ above all kingdoms. You've heard that language, he's the king of kings, right? Which, by the way, in the New Testament, it's only found in Paul's epistles, ironically. He's the only one that calls him king of kings. But anyway, if you want to elevate Paul above not just earthly kingdoms, but heavenly powers and principalities and dominions and everything that was made visible and invisible, he's the preeminent over all, that is Pauline language. 
That's how Paul talks about Jesus. So if you want to talk about Jesus as an earthly savior, that's good and fine, except that he's much more than that, and you learn that from the Apostle Paul and how Christ revealed himself to him. Okay, if you want to elevate Christ above you and above everything else, you, if you're complete in him who's above all principality and power, if you want to hold the head of the body, then you've got to follow Paul's pattern. Because you know what? Christ, I, I'm going to say something specific here. You've got to hear what I'm saying here. Christ is the head of the body. He wasn't the hand or the foot, right? So in this sense, Christ wasn't a member of the body. He was like a hand or a foot. He was the head, right? So you, you magnify the head. You glorify the head. You give honor and praise. You obey the head. You submit to the head in all things, right? He's above all. But Christ is not a pattern of how to be a member of his body. Do you get it? Christ doesn't submit to himself. He's the head. And he saves this chief of sinners and says, you do what I say as the head. Paul is the pattern to be a member of the body of Christ. That's what it looks like. For him to say, I'm crucified with him and my life's not mine, it's his now. I'm just a finger on his body. Paul says that. Christ is the one who's the head. Okay, that's a different relationship. So this is Paul magnifying, glorifying God through Christ. You don't worship the messenger yourself. This is what it means to be Pauline. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist, who didn't want anyone to name a denomination after him, said, there one, there's one that comes after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to lose. Remember that? What's that mean about John the Baptist? Not a guy you, you know, there's someone comes after him. And who is that? Jesus. All right, well, we're the Church of Christ. <laughs> In Acts 10.26, Peter, who began this thing at Pentecost here, goes to Cornelius, and Cornelius bows down to this guy. What's Peter say? Stand up, I'm just a man. Well, sorry, Roman Catholics, he's just a man. Right? And so in Acts 10, verse 26, Peter denied worship. In Acts 14, 15, Paul, sent by the gospel of grace, goes to Gentiles, who's never been sent a messenger from God, as far as an apostle of salvation. And he goes there and says, you can be saved by grace. You don't have to go to that synagogue and the law. You can be saved by grace by trusting Christ's finished work. And they say, you must be from the gods. That's what you said. And they start worshiping, worshiping him as Jupiter and, and Mars. Remember, they start lifting him up and praising him, giving him wreaths. And, and what's Paul do? Rips his clothes up. No, do not worship me. Right? I'm just an apostle. Galatians 2.11. He withstood Peter to his face. What's that tell you about Peter and Paul? Paul wasn't inferior to Peter. Peter wasn't a supervisor of Paul. Right? He was sent from Jesus. We've already talked about holding the word of God as sufficient and, 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 and complete. Paul writes, let God be true and every man a liar. He writes about fulfilling the word of God. Let's get into something a little more personal here. Your private life and heart is like Paul. If that's true, then you follow Paul. Paul prays more than any other person in the New Testament. <coughs> except for maybe Jesus. I'm not saying that just to give due to Jesus. But I mean, he does mention a lot of Jesus praying. But Paul, almost every epistle he writes, talks about him praying or his need to pray or what he prayed. He even lists out his prayers. Paul is prayerful. Following Paul means you pray often and frequently. It's in Paul that you find the instruction to pray without ceasing. If you want to pray frequently, then you're Paul, you need to be Pauline. And learn that you may not know how to pray as you ought. But you still need to make your request made known to God. You need to pray to Him. Cast, and, and, and the God of peace will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If your way of life is like Him, this is significant. How do you walk as a Christian? The answer would be by faith. Right? Paul is the pattern of that. Or you can say, after the Spirit... And Paul is the pattern of that. And I'm going to say something maybe groundbreaking for you here. The whole concept of walking after the Spirit, right, being led by the Spirit and walking after the Spirit, is uniquely Pauline. How can it be? There's so many books in the Christian bookstore, and they don't rightly divide, but they talk about the Spirit walk and everything else. It's Pauline. If you take Paul's epistles out of the Bible, all you have to talk about the Spirit is that there is one, and you may have him if you believe, and he gives you supernatural powers. Like tongues and healing, this sort of thing. Right? You read 1 Peter and 1 John, you read Revelation, that's all the talk about the Holy Spirit there is. It's that he is, there is a Holy Spirit, and you can identify. The Holy Spirit is a witness to those people. 
to witness that Jesus is the Son of God and that he w- testifies who's the believers and who's not in the new covenant. And he gives them that special power. But there is no talk at all in Peter, James, and John in those epistles about how to walk after the Spirit. That is Pauline language. The way, the fruit of the Spirit, Pauline language. That the Spirit, how God works today is through the Spirit's invisible working in you through His Word. That's Paul's language. And so if you're going to live and walk as a Christian today, you find it in Paul's epistles alone. You see? What's it mean to follow Paul? It means you walk after the Spirit, walk by faith. Are you getting the picture yet? It's like, me being a Christian depends on what Christ gave Paul for us. To say I follow Paul should not be some shameful thing. I follow Paul. Oh, you should follow Jesus. No, you should follow Paul. Right? And you don't have to be snarky about the thing, but it's like, look, let me show you here the instructions that Christ gave us here in the Scripture. How many times it says this, and how your walk of the Spirit's this, and how your will of God is revealed here, and how your prayer life is patterned here, and you know how the church should operate is patterned here. It's like, it's all right there in the Apostle Paul. Right? Your manner of life. Paul says, you know my manner of life, my patience, my long-suffering, my charity, my persecutions that I suffered. If you want to know what it's like to live through suffering and persecutions and dispensation, to know what it's like to have charity and patience amidst all those things, Paul's a pattern, folks. Okay? Peter's waiting for deliverance in a kingdom. Paul goes, he's given me the tools now, the sufficient tools to live through this. Right? That's what Christians need. That's why even those who don't rightly divide will find some of the strongest passages to deal with distress in Paul's epistles. It was popular to quote 1 Timothy during the coronavirus and 2 Corinthians 12 because those are the most helpful passages in the Bible and they're in Paul's epistles. You follow Paul. If you count all things but loss in your life, the most valuable thing in your life is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If that is true, then you're following Paul. Okay. If you're not trying to establish something on the earth to prove yourself worthy to God, but rather setting your affections on things above and saying all the things that were gained to me according to the world are lost for the knowledge of the excellency of Jesus Christ, then you're following Paul in his thought, in his pattern, in his walk. Okay. If you're willing to spin to be spent in ministry to others, that is the Apostle Paul. Right. If you are willing to be made all things to all men that you might save some, and have that charity to, for people's salvation. That's Pauline, folks. The whole evangelistic zeal of trying to see souls saved and saints edified is Paul's mission, is what Christ told him to do. Go to the world with this gospel of grace. The go to the world, he told Peter, was after you build my kingdom in Jerusalem, then go to the world with my kingdom blessings. But they're still trying to build the kingdom 2,000 years later. To Paul, he says, forget the kingdom. You're going to go preach my grace, get them saved. That's the message the church should be and hopefully is preaching. We need to follow Paul. Christ is the Savior, Christ is the head, He is the Lord, He is God, He is the King, and you are not any of those things, and neither is Paul. That's why you can say, I follow Him. How dare you follow Jesus? How's that going to happen? There are things that Jesus did you could never do. He's a sinless God, perfect manifest in the flesh. That's not you, folks. Right? He's the head. You're the body. He's the Lord. You're the servant. He's the king. You're just under him, right? He's the savior. You're the one that needs saved. And Paul fits that description for you, right? Those things, how to pattern yourself after it. So knowing that the pattern Christ gave to us, we follow Paul, and so should every Christian. Right? It's not as offensive now as after I explained all that stuff. That's what should be in your mind. And so, you don't have to blast people with all this the whole time you talk to them, but it's like, people need to know this. It's not something we should be ashamed of. It's, it's, it will organize the church better. It will direct them in God's will. It will magnify the cross of Christ to the praise of His glory. You know, We need more Pauline people, Pauline churches. Okay? All right. Any questions, any comments? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word complete and sufficient for us to be perfect as your ministers and your stewards. We thank you for revealing to us things that were kept secret and that uh, you've entrusted us with so that we will be able to help others see this uh, glorious gospel and fellowship with the mystery. We thank you for everyone here. And uh, I pray that we can strengthen each other in our understanding and knowledge that we might uh, be apt to teach and patient towards others as they be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. 
so that we can glorify you and your grace even more. Amen.